Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we are going to be overclocking a Ryzen 5 3600 on the MSI X570 uh, Tomahawk motherboard. So this is the very first time that I'm working with this CPU. I mean, I checked that the operating system I have works with the, the system, but um, yeah, I, I have no idea how this chip is going to overclock. Um, I've not used this motherboard before, but it should be just fine. Like, I've used plenty of X570 MSI boards, so I don't really expect any surprises. Also, the BIOS here is going to be extremely similar to any B550 MSI motherboards. So, uh, yeah, you like, if you have a 3600 and you're using a B550 MSI motherboard, you can basically follow what I do here for the, the thir for, for this CPU. And really for any other 3000 series chip as well. Uh, for cooling, I'm not using the stock cooler of the 3600 because, uh, yeah, I looked at that. It's it's a block of aluminum. Um, we're not using that. So <laughs> I'm using the Wraith Prism instead. So that's the heatsink that comes with a 3700X because uh, it's a pretty decent air cooler. So if you're going to be upgrade, like, you know, if you're going to be overclocking, I would assume that you buy yourself a slightly better, uh, you know, CPU cooler and maybe like a... Like, the Wraith Prism is still, like, it isn't that great compared to, like, a 120 millimeter, you know, single tower cooler at around the 20 to $30 uh, price point. But, uh, uh, it, it, like, I don't actually have a dual tower. Like, well, I don't have a heatsink like that. Um, so, yeah, that's why I'm using this. So, I'm not on, like, a, like I'm not on an AIO or something ridiculous like that because... Uh, it doesn't make sense to spend almost almost as much as your CPU costs on cooling, in my opinion. Well, it depends on the use case, but if you're just doing a regular daily build, that it doesn't make any sense to do that kind of thing. So anyway, here we are in the BIOS. Uh, we need to get out of easy mode. How is F7? Okay, it's it's different on uh, like Gigabyte. I think it's F2 to go uh, easy mode. Anyway, on F1, um, you get all your different BIOS sort of help tips there. So just going to show you that. Anyway, um, right now everything is completely stock, but the first thing I'm going to be doing is just enabling the XMP profile. The memory kit I'm using here is a 3466 CL16 Hynix CJR based uh, G-Skill Trident Z kit. Um, so yeah, I mean, optimally I would be using a 3600 CL16 kit, but 3466 is not that much slower than 3600. So this is fine as well. That's that's why I went with this kit. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll do a baseline run of Cinebench. Though, funnily enough, Cinebench does not care about memory settings, like, at all. Um, and in some situations, you can actually lose score when, at stock settings, you enable XMP because XMP eats a little bit into your power budget, and so you lose a bunch of boost, and Cinebench doesn't care about memory, so you... Well, you don't lose a bunch of boost, but you lose like a little bit of boost and Cinebench doesn't care about memory. So you, you basically just lose a couple points doing that. Um, and we're not going to be focusing on memory overclocking today. So Cinebench is just fine. This is a six core. We are not going to be doing Cinebench R20 just because it's going to take way too long. We're going to use R15. It does like the the thing is the heat load between either Cinebench is completely fine for monitoring hardware info, 60 uh, hardware info best monitoring software there is like don't use anything else and especially don't use hardware monitor hardware monitor is garbage it's been garbage since like the fx era um don't use it use hardware info hardware info is great um anyway so let's just run this now we'll find out if i screwed up something with the cooling system i didn't cpu is sitting at around 70 degrees which is actually surprisingly hot um, 90 watt, yeah, okay, it's a 65 watt CPU, so, uh, you know, AMD has a very, like, well, basically, I think they're just lying about the TDP, this should be, right, like, this should be spec'd as an 88 watt CPU, but the thing is, like, what they do is basically, they give you a 65 watt heatsink, so if you're on the stock cooler, the CPU will probably eventually throttle itself thermally down to 65 watts, because the heatsink can't do 88, so... That, that's AMD's DDP definition right there. It's like, it's not actually what the CPU is limited to. It's just what the heatsink can deal with. Anyway, so we've got a 1614. We should run that a couple times just because Cinebench isn't uh, super, uh, like, consistent. Um, yeah, temperatures are fine. We're boosting to a little over 4 gigahertz. So, I don't know. Like, this is a new CPU. Very, like, I, I bought it. 
uh, yesterday. So hopefully the silicon quality is good. I have no idea what to expect. Also, I'm wondering what voltage we're setting at when we run that. So, okay, so around 1600 is what this scores. And we're sitting at uh, around 1.3 volts running Cinebench. So, yeah, but right now, we're, like, we're hitting the power limit. So this doesn't tell us if we're, like, it doesn't tell us that we're maxing out the fit system of the CPU. We're just maxing out the power limit. So anyway, around 1600 is what it scores at stock. So hopefully I can push it to... Well, we're not doing 10%, because if you want to do 10, like, if you want a 10% increase in Cinebench score, you would have to go from 4 point, like, it's running, like, 4.075, so we'd have to be doing, like, 4.4 plus, which, I mean, I have heard of some Ryzen 3600s doing, like, 4.5 gigahertz, but I'd say those are probably anomalies rather than your average CPU. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. So first things first, we need to figure out the fit limits for the CPU and the cooling system. The cool thing about the fit limits is that, like, if, if you do this, um, the, like, basically we're going to find out, and we're just going to punch in something, like, we don't, like, the thing is, so if you, like, with the fit limits, we're, like, the, the thing is, if you don't have enough cooling and the chip ends up running at, like, 90 degrees or something, then the fit system is naturally going to lower the voltage to accommodate for that really high operating temperature. So, basically, it tells you exactly where the limit is, uh, even for, like, even, like, cooling considerations and everything. So, if you had a better cooling system, the fit will actually give you a higher voltage, a higher voltage recommendation because it's like, well, your cooling's good enough to take it. Anyway, we're not going to, like, the, the reason why I'm not just punching in something like that for every single one of these limits is that AMD's lovely boost algorithm tends to glitch out if you do something like that. So instead, we're going to go for a unreasonably high, but, like, the, the thing is, this is a 6-core. Um, the 3700X, I don't think I've ever seen do over 150 watts. So we can just sort of punch in one, like, I, I assume if we just punch in 160 or something like this, uh, for every single one of these values, it shouldn't glitch anything out, but we should be maxed out on the power limit. The scaler, I'm going to leave at 1x because, uh, there's some really, like, in my past testing, the higher scalers, they don't really affect your single core or your max, like, full core workloads in terms of voltages, but they do some really weird things with the voltages in the medium load range. So, like, between, like, from two cores down to, like, uh, you know, well, like, 14 threads of load. Actually, no. By, by then you're pretty much, so depends on the workload, but basically for medium loading, the scalers actually do stuff to the voltage. They don't really do anything to the perform, like they don't ne actually don't do anything to the performance at all, but your worst case scenario and your best case scenario doesn't change. So it's just like, we're not going to change the, the scaler at all. And we're not going to adjust really anything else here either. Yeah, this should be enough. Well, actually, we could max these out just in case. And this this BIOS is a little on the laggy side right now. Actually, I think this is on the BIOS that the board shipped with. I should have probably updated the BIOS. Oh, well, whatever. It doesn't really change the methodology that much, though. It might change... Like, the thing is, the PBO works a little bit differently with the various AGSA versions. So it might affect that a bit. Like, it won't affect the static overclock, but it can affect the, the how the fit behaves. Like, I think some of the really early BIOSes actually have more aggressive voltage uh, behavior than the, like, more recent BIOSes. Anyway. So now we're... Oh, no, that's, that's 20. That's not 15. I don't want to run 20. So I don't expect too much of a performance uplift, but since we were originally riding, like it was right up against the power limit, um, I do expect a an improvement now. Um, so we're just gonna run that. Let's see. No, I didn't want to drag anything. Huh, it's still sitting at the same power limit. 
If anything, it looks like it's running slower. Did I screw up something? Yeah, it's running the same as before. Oh, boy. Okay, well, I guess we're not going to open Ryzen Master because this is that OS where it's broken. Like, all I wanted to do was check if the, the settings took. I don't believe Cinebench, like, like it was still reading 80, 86 watts, so... What if I put these back to auto? I, th this, like, obnoxious AMD software. <laughs> like, it, the thing is, the, the behavior is not even completely consistent across different motherboards. I think the most vanilla implementation of AMD BIOS is Gigabyte, and then, like, MSI is, like, MSI works, but they ha definitely have done some, like, e extra things to their BIOS. And then there's, like, ASRock, where ASRock's BIOS has, like, broken power limits a lot of the time. Um, but, um, yeah, so... Anyway, let's run Cinebench 15, and this time I'll actually make a shortcut for it, because I do not feel like going into this folder all the time. No, it's still running right up against the power limit. Am I stupid or something? Like, does this chip, like... Uh, it's not impulsive. No. Eight core max, like, so the eight cores max out a little over 100. I guess it makes sense that the six core wouldn't really go above 90 watts no matter what you do. But that's annoying. CPU features. I wonder if... Yeah, no, these are all set. Also, apparently this works on the 3600s, but I've never tried that, so let's try that. Like, the 160 is a lot. Maybe it's too much. And this is why you should just leave your Ryzen at stock. <laughs> I'm joking. Though, actually, for some of the CPUs, it does make sense. Like, my 3700X does not overclock at all. That's, like, an early launch CPU, and so... Yeah, that one's really bad. Um, and I've made it worse over time. Mostly because I just wouldn't, like, yeah, by just mashing voltage into it to compensate for the silicon quality. And so that's just been getting worse. <laughs> anyway. Let's run this in a bench again. Nah. No, nah, the, the the frequency setting still doesn't do anything. Uh, well, eh, no, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, we're still at 1.3-ish volts. Like, temperatures are fine, and we're riding right up against the power limit. So I guess it's just not going to give us any more voltage for this. Or, like, any more boost for this, regardless of what I do. Yeah. And the, the reason why the score is low is because I was, like, opening up stuff while it was running.
You know, I take back what I said about the, the prism being decent. Like, if you actually buy a proper, like, 120 millimeter tower cooler, it's going to be a hell of a lot quieter than the prism. <laughs> this thing's loud. Like, surprisingly loud. I wasn't, like, for the fact that this is a 6-core, I was expecting this to do a much better job, but... Yeah, no, it doesn't. Okay, so the next test I want to run is worst case scenario. Because the Cinebench it is not actually that heavy. So what we're going to run now is 128K, uh, 128 k FFT size Prime 95. And this should be with AVX. So it should run at lower voltages. Yeah. So looks like... And we're, we're going to let this warm up a bit. We are on a small air cooler, so it should saturate pretty quick. It looks like the voltage limit's going to be like 1.29, 1.28. Um, and Cinebench was running a little over 1.3. I'm just going to reset the monitoring. There we go. Because I want to watch the, the minimum voltage. Um, and the thing is, as the temperature goes up, the voltage is going to go down. Oh, no. Okay, so now the, the power limit actually does something. So for whatever reason, it's just Cinebench. So I guess Cinebench was already riding the voltage limit at stock. And Prime 95 was, like, Prime 95 would have hit the power limit if I had run it at stock. Because right now we're at 110 watts, which is 20 watts above the power limit. Okay, so it looks for, like, my voltage settings. I'm probably going to be looking at, like, 1.32 with about 50 millivolts of droop. Maybe more. But that's kind of what I'm thinking right now. Because just looking at... Because we're, we're getting, you know, down to... The, the thing is, is... Are you going to be running Prime 95 24-7, right? Like, that's that's another consideration. Is like, how much load are you going to be putting on your CPU? I still don't think... Like, so, like, I'd be willing to tolerate being 10, 20 millivolts above the fit limit if I also consider the fact that I'm never going to run my CPU this hard, right? Because you, you can see in Cinebench, it was sitting at 1.3 to like 1.33 volts, and that's because Cinebench is a much milder multi-core workload. Um, I think it's maxed out on the temperatures. I wonder if we have a VRM temperature sensor on this. Yes, we do. Math is... <laughs> <laughs> the board just doesn't care. Like with the the prism being a downdraft cooler, and the fact that this board's VR, like this board is completely overkill for this. Interesting that we're getting a bit of vol voltage disparity between the VR V out. The thing is, this sensor I do believe is far more like this sensor should be more accurate than SVI two TFN, even though the SVI two TFN sensor is actually just the CPU reporting what the VRM tells it, and the VRM tells it this. So th those should be exactly the same, unless there's something very wrong with, like, the software configuration of the motherboard. Um, anyway, yeah, so I, I kind of wish I had a bigger cooler on this. Like, still, I would, like, putting an AIO on a 6-core CPU, in my opinion, is kind of like, okay, that this is not realistic and not useful to, to somebody actually considering a Ryzen 3600 build, because they're not going to spend $100 on an AIO, but... Yeah, you know, like a $20 heatsink would have probably gone a long way because this, this, uh, this isn't great. The thi I think AMD actually rates the Prism as being a 125 watt cooler, so it's not really a surprise that at 110 watts it's maxed out. Or, you know, getting max, like close to maxed out. Um... Yeah, the board just doesn't... Like, the thing is, we have airflow from the CPU cooler hitting the VRM, so this is not going to have any kind of thermal issues. Anyway, so I, that's that's it for, for Prime 95, um, which, uh, yeah, so minimum voltage 1.25 volts, so, you know, 20 millivolts above that, I'll still tolerate it. So it's everything, and... Wait, did I f not close Prime properly? No, I did. Oh, right, AMD implemented, uh, there, there's fan, like, there's smoothing on the die temperature, like, the t uh, control temperature is smoothed out. So you can see how the die temperature is, like, way lower right now than the, the control temperature, sl like, control slash die temperature. 
And the re reasoning behind that is if you slow down how quickly the temperature ramps up and down, that's the temperature that's actually used for fan control. So you slow down the ramp on that and you don't get the, like early, early Ryzen CPUs would have a really nasty, like the fan would just freak out at random because the temperature reading would update really quickly. And like, because of the like burstiness of the boost algorithm, you'd get spikes of high temperature on the CPU that would translate into, you know, fan speed spikes, which were really annoying. Um, and completely ineffective because ultimately the reason the temperature was high was because the heat had a hard time leaving the CPU, not because the CPU was actually, like, there, there was no need to ramp up the fan. It was like, it was 20 watts of uh, heat being generated by one core. Like, you're just not gonna get rid of that. There's nothing you can do about it. Anyway, so yeah, at this point I have my, you know, voltages. So we're gonna go down to here and we're gonna go override mode 1.33 I said 1.33 thank you very much uh, load line calibration I think we're gonna start with mode 4 and we're gonna see where it goes um, from there uh, CPU over voltage protection we're gonna max that out over current protection max that out switching frequency you can leave that on auto but well actually this board I'm not sure if this board has it, but some of the other MSI boards will have glitches, like 1000 kilohertz doesn't work um, all the time. So don't, like, I wouldn't go to that setting even, like, even if you don't have any VRM issues, thermal issues. The thing is, this basically, the idea behind this is, is it can slightly improve your transient response. Um, the downside is it increases your VRM heat output. With a 3600, I don't really think this is too important to adjust, but and we can bump it up to 700 kilohertz and it's not gonna change anything. We're gonna leave temperature alone. Load line calibration for the SOC. We can actually leave that alone because we're just running XMP, so I don't need to worry about that. Um, VR 12 volt in, we're gonna max that out. So there, that's that's everything adjusted the way I'd like to adjust it. And now let's go to the CPU. And actually, we have per CCX on this, don't we? There's only two CCXs, though, so this is probably not going to go very far. Yeah, okay, no, we're, we're not going to go. So we're going to go all core, and I'm going to start at uh, 41. We're, we're going to start with 41 just because that's a little bit above what the CPU would naturally boost to. And at this point, the thing is, with Ryzen, as soon as you change your, your core ratio it disables all the power management stuff. Um, in fact, I think it even disables C states, though that depends also somewhat on the motherboard. Like some motherboards will still have C states working. Um, some boards don't. So we'll, we'll see once we get into Windows if it's always stuck at 4.1 gigahertz or not, but um, it very well should be at this point. Not that it's a big deal for your idle power consumption because the CPU, like if the CPU isn't doing anything, sitting at 4.1 gigahertz doesn't actually like pull that much power, even if you're at 1.33 volts. Like the, the power draw is much more affected by what you're running than what the settings the CPU is at. Get Cinebench, hardware info. Like I first want to check that I didn't screw up my voltage settings for Cinebench and then we're going to run Prime95 because I like Prime95 is way hotter. So if we have a, if we have a thermal issue in Cinebench, then I, I, Prime95 is going to complain a lot. Okay, voltage is, that's a less droop than I was aiming for. Like, power consumption is obviously higher because the voltage is static now. Um, yeah, that's a lot less droop than what I was aiming for. And we got a very mild score increase because, you know, technically we're like 25 megahertz faster than stock. Sometimes. Okay, now we're, yeah, 1625, so that's the highest score so far. It's still not a great score. 
Um, so let's see prime 95. I'm starting to get the feeling that this mouse might like the optical sensor on this mouse is going. It keeps randomly glitching out. Okay. Yeah, I really overshot it on the LLC setting. Yeah. Yeah, I I I overdid that. There's not enough droop. There's nowhere near enough droop. So we can just restart. Like, that was, what, like, 10, 20... It was, like, 10 millivolts of droop, which is, like, I was aiming for 70. So I'm just going to set the LLC all the way down to, to mode 8 or whatever. Because, uh... Yeah, there, there was, like, no V-droop on that. Which is not good. Like, it's not good for your transient response and also just... Like, I could lower the voltage, but the, the thing is... Um... Well, actually, I have a video covering that, so I'll hopefully I'll remember to include the video on why you don't want to just have zero V droop um, somewhere in the description. So we're just going to max that all the way out. Also, I get the feeling even with that, it's probably not going to droop as much as I want it to. Um, so we might lower the voltage a little bit. But also, I think at this point we can start raising the frequency. So I'm going to go to 42... If this runs Cinebench, this is already way better than my 3700X. <laughs> Man, that chip is so bad. It needs like 1.4 volts to do Cinebench at 4.2. That's also kind of why it's got been getting worse over time. Actually, I think it needs a little over 1.4 for 4.2. So... Yeah, I, I really hope that this time I'm lucky. My 3950X is very average as far as I'm concerned, but this, that like, my, my 3700X is just awful. Okay, so we're at 1.32, 1.312. Okay, now I'm getting more droop than I was aiming for. <laughs> right, because now we're all the way down at 1.256 in Cinebench, whereas I was aiming for... Like, so Cinebench runs around 97 amps. Uh, actually, no, that's not right. It's running 85 watts. So Prime 95 runs over 100. So Prime 95 is probably going to be hitting like, what, like 1.22, 1.23, maybe, maybe even less than that. So now I have way too much droop. I'm rerunning it because I wasn't happy that it spat out a 1620. That's more like it. But yeah, the, the thing is Cinebench is almost linear with just frequency, like CPU frequency. So, you know, stock, where's the calculator? Stock was like 40, the no, 47.5. And actually I'm doing this backwards. So we're at 4,200 right now. Stock was like 47.5, right? So we've gone up 3%, um, which originally it was scoring like 1,600. And yeah, so we're, we're underperforming a little bit. But the thing is, it wasn't really 40.75. It was like 4,100 to 40.75, so... Yeah, um, no, I wouldn't like to save the benchmark score. So Cinebench, I'd, I'd want it to be hitting like 1.27 load. 1.256 is way too low. So we're going to go up to mode 7, I think. It would be really neat if motherboards actually specified the load line settings in, like, well, milliohms of resistance. Go.
Actually, I'm going to bump up the voltage back up. I guess I could have bumped up the frequency again as well. We could have gotten like some some stability testing in along with the just dialing in the voltage settings right now, but eh, it should be fine. Hardware info and Cinebench and right. I'm just going to fire that off. No. Okay, now we're getting like 1.28. So Prime 95 should be pretty close to that because we're pulling, you know, we're pulling almost 90 watts here. And the V-droop is based on how much current the CPU is pulling. So if the CPU is pulling 90 watts, then, and you droop, how much is this? This is drooping like 60 um, millivolts. Then at 110, like at 110 watts, we should be drooping another, um, what is that? Going from 90 to 100, like 10%, something like that. So eh, we'll probably end up at around 1.24. So now we can actually run Prime 95. So FFTs. And also it's worth noting that the really small FFTs like 16K and that kind of thing, they're actually colder on Ryzen than 128K, which is why I'm running 128. Yeah, so we're getting that 1.256. As the temperature of the CPU comes up a bit, um, the voltage might come down because the CPU pulls more power the, the hotter it runs. And therefore, obviously, you get more droop. So I'm going to wait for it to get back up to around 90 degrees. We are pulling a bit more power than, than at stock, and that's just because the frequency is now higher. Um, the CPU power consumption is basically, like, your CPU power draw is pretty much linear with uh, core clock and uh, quadratic with voltage. So if you go from, like, 1.1, if you go from 1 volt to 1.1 volts, you get a 21% increase in power consumption, ignoring any thermal effects, as in normally what happens when you go up, you know, 10% in voltage and you get your 21% nominal current draw increase, you also get an operating temperature increase that further increases the overall power consumption. Uh, also going from, say, 4 gigahertz to 4.4 gigahertz will lead to a roughly 10% increase in power consumption. So, um... Yeah, at completely stock settings, it was hovering around 1.28 volts and pulling 110 watts. Well, now we're at 4.2 gigahertz and pulling 116, um, which is what I'd expect. Also, the temperature's gone up a bit. So I think the droop right now is about perfect. Because <laughs> if I, uh, if I re reduce the V-droop anymore, this is going to get, like, we're going to hit 95 degrees, and that's that's not okay. Um so we're going to stop that. I'm just going to shut down and restart. And now we're just going to crank up the c CPU frequency until it stops being able to run Prime 95. I have no idea why this OS takes so long to shut down. <laughs> Probably has something to do with why Ryzen Master doesn't want to start on it either. And maybe also the fact that it's like a legacy Windows 10 install. You might be like, why is it a legacy Windows 10 install? Well, I used it for x58, so that's, that's part of it. Um... Right, actually, at this point, we just want to change the frequency. I'm just going to go straight to 4.4. I, I want to see. Like, I want to see how quickly it doesn't work. <laughs> or maybe I got mega lucky and it does work. I mean, it boots. That That's a really great sign. Like, if I wanted to boot 4.4 gigahertz on my 3700X, I'd be at 1.45 volts. So this chip is, like, so much better. If it's stable at 4.4, like, that is actually worth running every day. Like, all day, every day, this would be totally worth running. 
except for the part where the cooler's not quite up to the task. So I'm going to start with Cinebench because I want to see like Cinebench, not a good stability test, but it doesn't insta crash. Man, the, the this new silicon is just crazy. Like, this is so much better than my 3700X. Yeah, and now, now we're pulling, what, oh no, still 91 watts. I don't get what this, this current reading right here is supposed to be. Like, where is that even coming from? Because the VRM is reading, that's a bit low. Oh, and now we're getting 1700, so that's nice. Yeah, so at this point, I would just let it, you know, run Prime 95 for like an hour. And I think it just crashed. Yeah, it just crashed. So 4.4 doesn't seem to be possible. But like, you know, it ran for a couple seconds, which is impressive. And I do believe the max boost on these chips is 4.3. So if you can run 4.3 on all your cores, stable, that's as far like that's still worth it as far as I'm concerned. But let's try for CCX, which shouldn't affect Cinebench scores too much. I, normally, I'd assume that CCX0 is higher quality than CCX1. So we're going to try 44 and 4, 43. Actually, 43, 5. And 44, 50. There. I'm going to go look up the, the stock specs for a 3600. I believe the max boost for single core is 4.3. In which case, like, th this is just always faster at this point. Like, max boost clocked up to 4.2. Oh, hell, like, it, yeah, if, if we... <laughs> okay, so this is definitely worth it as far as I'm concerned. Like, at stock settings, this chip will literally only boost up to 4.2 gigahertz. Max boost for AMD, maximum uh, achievable by single core. Yeah, so it, single core boost is 4.2 gigahertz. Then it's like I can run probably like this will run at least 4.3, I think. Um, so at this point, it's just like, yeah, th this is totally worth running static. I mean, it's not a huge performance increase, right? Like going from what, 1600-ish to I'm assuming 1700-ish. Okay, so CCX0, I'm, uh, CCX0 did not like my, my approach to the frequency. <laughs> that died even faster. I guess we could try the other way around as well, just to see if, like, which CCX is weaker. As in, like, 43, 50, or more like, bleh, 44, 44, 50. If this doesn't crash, then... That tells us that CCX1 is stronger than CCX0. Which, uh, like, it's not impossible. It's just, like, as far as I'm aware, it should always be the first CCX that is better. But, I like, the thing, at the same time, it's not like I've binned a bunch of CPUs. This is literally my third Ryzen 3000. So, yeah. Also, it's worth noting that if you're doing a bunch of, like, over, like... CPU overclocking is generally not too bad on the braking operating system side of things, but uh, me memory overclocking has a tendency to just destroy operating systems because um, you can sometimes get into the OS with settings that just cause horrible amounts of corruption before they really error out. And uh, yeah, so because of that, you should probably make a small like spare partition or just get a really cheap 60 gig SSD or something like like just anything that you can use for stress testing. I guess if you find viable like good like I've not messed around with this but in theory you could probably stress test on Linux um, and then just go back to using your Windows system anyway because <laughs> the thing is like you can boot Linux off of a USB stick so you won't need even like an entire SSD for it. Anyway Let's get Cinebench. And actually, we don't need hardware info because we know for a fact that this isn't going to overheat. And okay, so CCX0 is the weaker CCX on my CPU. Um, that's fun. 
and dis well yeah i'm not sure that that's actually a major concern like me like the the thing i'm wondering is like okay if ccx0 is worse than ccx1 single threaded applications are probably going to prefer running on ccx0 compared to ccx1 so yeah that's that's not great Oh, and then it died again. Okay. So, CCX1 is better, but not that much better. So, I'm assuming this should be able to do something like 4350 with uh, 44 on the second chip. At the, on, on the second. Actually, it could have still been CCX0 crashing that, but hard to say at this point. Because the thing is, we know, like, at 4.4 all cores, it crashed on the second run. So it's like, right now, it's just like, is it because of CCX1 or is it because of CCX0? I don't know. Could be either of them. Um, now the question is, how quickly will it die when I open Prime95? But the thing is, even even if I got stuck at 4.3 gigahertz, like, this is still faster than stock under all conditions. So I would consider that very much worth it. And I am opening up hardware info for Prime95 because it does run hot, and I do want to see the temperatures. And it is worth noting that Ryzen does get less stable as it gets hotter. So again, if you had a better heatsink than what I'm using with the Wraith Prism... Um, the lower temperatures would slightly improve stability. Also, it wouldn't be as loud. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. And it died. <laughs> That's roughly what I was expecting. Forty-three... 4350. I'm just assuming that there's a 50 megahertz gap between the two two CCXs. There's nothing saying that there has to be. Like, I think on my 3950X, there's a 100 megahertz gap between the weakest and the strongest CCX. Actually, on the same CCD, um there's a 100 megahertz gap. Across the entire chip, I think there's like 150 or 200 megahertz gap. As in, I have one CCD that runs like 4450 or 44, and then they're like the worst CCD is 4250. I know for a fact that the worst one is 4250 because the whole chip is stuck at 42. Like if I just do per, like if I do the whole chip as uh, all core overclock, then it gets stuck at 4250. Um, but if I go per CCX, I think there's one CC like one CCX that goes all the way up to four forty four fifty, and then like the the other CCX on that same CCD is forty three fifty or forty three hundred. I'm not sure right now. So Prime ninety five. Oh, covered up hardware info. I'm, well, actually, considering how quickly it crashed the first time, I, gu I guess we can just fire it off and see. Okay, fan is spinning up. Hasn't managed to die yet. That's pretty good. Doesn't really mean anything right now, but... Yeah, so at this point, you might want to, like, I, it might be worth it to bump up the CCX1 again. Like, maybe CCX1 will do 4.4. So, yeah, that's it. This that that's basically it for for the overclocking here. This is way like like first of all, it's actually worth it because we are you know a hundred megahertz above, like at least a hundred megahertz above single core boost. The voltages are completely acceptable even for for Prime ninety five. I mean, and there it goes. Okay, it died again. As long as we're above 4.2 gigahertz, I consider it worth it. Because it is actually, like, it is an overclock for both single core and all core workloads. 
I'm not sure. Like, I wish there was some way to know which CCX is causing the crashing, but there isn't. So... Yeah. Like, I, I can drop one down 50 megahertz. If it still crashes, I can drop the other one down 50 megahertz. And then eventually what I what I would do is I would run Prime95 with FFTs from 32K all the way up to 100. No, for Ryzen, I think you should go up to like 256 or something. Or like, like on Intel, once you go past like 192K, it actually doesn't, it, it's not, it doesn't really change. Like it, it just gets really cold and, and basically worthless. Um, but if on, on Ryzen, because the L3 caches are so big, I think it actually, like, all the way, 192K is still really hot and uh, very, like, like is still hard to run. But I'm not sure where, like, the... So I'd probably go up to, like, 256. So I, I'd run from 32K FFT size all the way up to 256K FFT size, and I'd run that for an hour. And then, I don't know. No, not Intel burn test. Um, not sure what other workloads I would throw at it. Like the thing is, Linpack is a bit weird on on AMD systems, just because it is meant for Intel CPUs, um, not for AMD CPUs. So it doesn't really like it, it behaves a bit weird. So I'm not sure that that would actually be a good stress test for this. Prime ninety five is definitely fine. It's just that I don't like trusting just a single a single stress test for for all of my my uh, stability testing, and we lost worker twelve, which is which. Oh, there goes the whole thing. Okay, so I could also bump up the voltage another. Well, actually, I can't. The chip is almost at 95 degrees, so it's like again, if I had a better cooler, I would actually be willing to bump it up another 10 millivolts. But as it is, uh, nope. Like the the cooling is just not good enough, in my opinion. So considering that it was losing like core 12 or something, um, I think CCX zero at this point is not the issue. So we're I'm gonna bring that one back up to 43. It's a shame that I didn't like. I know. Well, I wasn't paying that much attention to Prime ninety five crashing workers or anything. The the first couple of crashes. So, we'll see. Like the the thing about per CCX overclocking is it just means you have more stuff to test, as in different combinations of settings. So if you don't want to mess with that, you can go all core. And ultimately, considering that at most there's going to be like a hundred megahertz gap well again i'm not sure but i'd assume there's probably not going to be much more than like 100 megahertz gap between the ccx's um and it's not really worth it spending a bunch of time maximizing each ccx unless you're on something like a 16 core where you have four of the damn things um because if you're on a on say a six core like this well having half your cores running 50 megahertz higher or 100 megahertz higher ultimately means that you're average overall overclock it only increases by 50 megahertz right so if the if the gap between the cores is less than 25 like if the gap between the ccx's is like 50 megahertz then you may as well just go the same clock for all the cores at the same time which i think like looking at how this is behaving right now that's i'm very strongly considering that option oops Well, now it just hard crashed again. Yeah, so this... So, I like, it crashed faster as far as I'm concerned. So at this point... Eh, no, 4325, I'll leave that.
I really wish I had a better cooler. <laughs> yeah, because the, the thing is, like, the CPU does actually get less stable as you go over 90. So yeah, ba basically at this point, all you do is just like all I would be do well, all I'm doing and all I would be doing if I was setting this up for my daily would be, you know, set set a combination of CCX ratios, run Prime ninety five for an hour. If it doesn't make it for an hour, then lower the ratios until it does pass an hour, at least an hour of Prime 95. Like, there's some people who swear by testing for 24 hours, which I think is kind of ridiculous. Um, and, but at the same time, it's like you could just leave it on overnight, right? Which, again, would just... The, the thing is, though, it's just like if it lasts an hour, I consider that good enough. If you maybe have, which, and the reason I'd consider that good enough is I don't normally have, like, workloads that have to run overnight. So there's very, like, it's unrealistic for me to have, like, a bunch of unsaved work that takes several hours to produce, right? So I don't care if the system is ever so slightly unstable. But yeah, temperature-wise, this isn't doing great. Like, I really wish it was lo further away from 95 degrees than it is, but it, it's, it's all, like, it's right up against it. So pulling almost 130 amps now. Actually, no, that's EDC again. Why, why does this sensor exist? Can I remove that? I'm, I'm just going to remove that. Is there a way to remove it? Disable monitoring. There we go. Much better. Yeah. Like, this reading down here should be accurate. Wait, 75 times 1.24. That doesn't seem to be... That doesn't seem... Well, it is only pulling 117 watts. And yet... Well, okay. The cooler is just barely handling this. Yeah, if you had something like a... Like a Hyper 212 clone... Not the Hyper 212 itself, because I think it's honestly kind of, like, it tends to go for around $30, which I think is a little bit too much. Because you can find a bunch of basically identical four heat pipes, one 120mm one fan tower coolers for slightly less than a Hyper 212. So if you had one of the Hyper 212 clones that is cheaper, the temperatures would be better. Um, so, yeah. And it just crashed again. So again, we lower the free, like lower the ratios, run Prime 95. So at this point, I feel like this is the end of the video because there's not really much to it at this point other than just lowering the, the, the clock speeds. And at this point, I what I would lower first is CCX1 because that's the highest clocked one. Um, so it's probably the one that's crashing or at least that's which one I'm guessing, uh, assuming is crashing. If I had a bit more cooling, I'd bump up the voltage a bit, but... Um, like, for right now, I'd bump up the voltage a bit. Because the thing is, at stock, it was running up to, like, 1.26 volts in Prime 95. And right now, we're at, like, 1.25. So, you know, it's just... But at the same time, I'm also running hotter than at stock. Like, well, not stock, but with the PBO settings, I'm running hotter than the PBO settings. So, yeah, this is maxed out. Like, you know, it, it's approaching maxed out at this point. So... That's basically how I'd overclock any Ryzen CPU, right? It's just like, set up your PB, like... G and, and the thing is, just max out the PBO limits, not completely, just raise them up. For a 3950X, you're going to see the highest power consumption in Prime 95 with uh, limits of like... Well, the, the watt limit doesn't actually matter, but the TDC and the EDC, if you set them too high, it glitches out and you actually get less boost, not more. So... For EDC and TDC, you normally have to set, like, 230 um, with a 3950X. I'm not sure if that's consistent. Like, I assume that should be consistent for 3900Xs and any other CPUs like that as well. It's probably even it, it would probably even work for this 3600, but there's no reason to do that, in my opinion, just because it's never going to pull more than 100 amps anyway. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's why I just set it to 160. 
um, or more than 100. And th more than 100 is probably possible, but more than 160 isn't. Like, <laughs> the chip is going to die before you push that much current through it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so basically, max out PBO limits. Leave the scaler on 1x because the a higher scaler setting is just do weird stuff, and ultimately they don't affect the Prime95 voltage, at least not in my past testing. And then, you know, like for your sort of idle voltage, what I go with is the Cinebench load voltage, right? Or something close to the Cinebench load voltage. And a lot of people might be like, but why would you, why would you set it like that's relatively low? Um, but the thing is, is just like with Cinebench, you at least know that all the cores are running and doing something. Whereas if Ryzen is left to its like fully stock Ryzen completely shuts down certain cores, which is why it can go all the way up to like 1.45 volts um, on a single core or two cores. And, you know, you, you get that really aggressive low thread count boost behavior. And it's because the, the CPU is doing a bunch of power management stuff that isn't active when you start doing static overclocking. And well, most of that power management stuff probably isn't do anything, doing anything if you're running Cinebench. Therefore, Cinebench load voltages are reasonable idle all core load voltages. Also, like... There, in my opinion, there's really no reason to be going above, you know, like th this much voltage right now because I have plenty of V-droop, right? Like w I have plenty of V-droop and I don't need more. Um, yeah, so this is fine. Also, I did want to check if that VRM current reading was accurate. So let me just quickly run the math on that. Um, 785. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, I guess it was including SOC power in that. Because it was package power. That still doesn't make sense how it was getting up to 117 watts, though. Because that's 94 for the cores. And then you'd have to have... Like, the SOC would have to be almost 22 watts, which is just like... No? I don't, like, yeah... So I guess the, like this, there's like power readings on motherboards being accurate is an exception, not the norm. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so there, that's it. That's how I would overclock Horizon 3600. So uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below if you'd like to support what I do here uh with uh actually hardcore overclocking i have a patreon there's a link to that down in the description below which speaking of the patreon thank you for the 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 3600 and uh then there's also the ahoc teespring store where you can pick up shirts stickers posters and you know the usual youtuber merch so yeah there's links to both down in the description below if if you'd like to support the channel then that's that's how you can do that and that's it for the video so thank you for watching and goodbye